Hello there, I'm Gary. Welcome to my channel and welcome back if you've been here before. Now today is the last of the videos from the Airfix presentations at the recent day out at Ormby HQ in Margate. Today is all about the Q&A session we had at the end of the morning. Now there were some interesting questions and some actually quite revealing answers as well. If you like the video, uh, you know by now what to do. Uh, like it, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and go to my partner programs if you want to give a bit of concrete support to future productions. So hosting the session was Dale Lighthurst, Head of Brand for Airfix, and the first question was about sustainability, um, about recycling the plastic on the spruce that they supply already, but also are they looking to more sustainable products to use in the future, mainly plastics not sourced from the petrochemical industry? I can answer the recycling related. These guys will have to answer the material side, um, although I'm aware that Lego are obviously working on a number of plant-based materials. Um, the recycling, so all our plastic can be recycled. Uh, the only thing of the product itself that is a bit tricky is the plastic bag. The, sprues come in. So we are working at, at, and looking at other solutions instead of plastic bags. So uh, the Spitfire being moulded in the UK, the 124 scale Spitfire being moulded in the UK, gives us an option to look at a different type of material to um, put in between the, the plastic sprues. For us, there's a, there is a, um, it's not a compromise, but we have to be mindful of wastage as well. So if we don't start putting the um, clear parts into a protective bag and we start scratching, uh, delivering plastic kits with clear parts all scratched up, then those, that plastic's going in the bin, we're making more plastic. So we've, we've, there, is a, there is a balance to be had. And it's the same for the grey plastic as well. Uh, we have to make sure that that is protected so we're not wasting product just for the sake of it not being in a plastic bag. So um, that's my answer to one of your questions. Are we looking at any other material at the moment? The material thing is very difficult, as you can imagine. Um, Lego can look at other materials more easily than us because you're not gluing it together and you're not painting it. Um, so it's going to be a problem, I think is the truth. Um, we haven't looked at alternative alternative materials in great detail yet but it's not going to be easy I think is the truth um, and you may even find that there isn't a material that works as well that, mm -hmm. that is biodegradable at the end of the day um, we just don't know yet is the mm -hmm. there's so many unknowns with the biodegradable plastics and, and new plastics coming through as well mm -hmm. and we really don't know how long the plastic will last for. So if you start building plastic model kits out of it, A, how is the glue going to react to it? It might not work. You, you, we might have to invent a brand new glue that might be even more toxic to the environment. Um, you might have to start using super glue, not ideal. So um, let alone paints and things. So, um, and we know that there's a, there's a mixture of um, modelers slash collectors out there, you know, um, and if, you're, if you buy a model kit and put it in your loft for 20 years, and obviously temperatures in people's lofts or, or sheds or, or wherever tend to massively vary during the course of the year, with the winter, the summers, etc., etc., then is that plastic going to survive that after a sustained period of time? We don't know at, at the moment. So uh, it is something that is always a topic of discussion. Um, but. Are we planning to change anything just yet? No, but we are we are constantly um, talking about it in the office and, and seeing what we can do. So next, and something a lot of you have asked, is Airfix planning to bring back production to the UK? You said that the Spitfire is being produced over here. Yeah, I let that one slip during the live Q and A. Yeah. yeah. So, and you also mentioned the problems you've got with containers. I mean, there's congestion in the ports because of the transshipment problems onto the railway roads. Your spot price of a container is what, five, six times what it was pre-COVID, even yeah. though it's coming down, it's still massively high. It's never going to go back down to 1500 bucks or whatever. 
a container, is the economics starting to look like it's better to bring it back on shore? Um, the short answer is no, um, okay. which is amazing. Uh, and with the container prices starting to come back down again, then any discussions that started to happen have sort of just faded away. Um, would it be cheaper for us to make a Spitfire in the UK, uh, in, in India? Uh, yes, is, is the short answer. So why is it in the UK? Uh, it's what because decision. it's it's a 124 scale Spitfire, and what better thing to do is is mould that back in the UK? You know, and there were to 22,300 odd Spitfires ever made, you know, and that's the number. Yeah, there will be a big party here when, uh, and if we ever get to that number with that kit made in the UK, because I think that would be a, a, a lovely PR story to say Airfix have equaled the number of um, total Spitfires made, Al albeit one particular mark, mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think that's just a lovely story um, to have. Moulding in the UK and India brings its different challenges. Um, I feel like I'm talking for these guys as well, but um, no, okay. sure. I think um, without getting too involved in the commercials, um, the plastic parts probably don't cost any more to create in the UK. It's the, it's the rest of the product that is expensive to make in the UK. And, and that balances out the shipping cost saving um, from not bringing it in for so a So you're talking about so you're saying the creation of the model, the tooling, and also the train breakdown what you just said then. That so so the, tooling, the tooling is made in China yeah. irrespective of whether production goes to India or the UK. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't make any difference where the tooling is made. But so where are the extra costs that make it commercially viable to stay in India rather than come back to the UK. Packaging is, Packaging is more expensive in this country than it is out in India. Barge. So we're, we're, we're having to buy twice as many Spitfire boxes that we need in the first 12 months to make it uh, more economical for us on price. And even then, it is still cheaper to get that box made in India. Really? So it's so not the model itself then, or the molding, it's, it's the actual... It's that's what I didn't said, understand. Yeah. It's yeah. said, the actual plastic yeah. cost yeah. is... is pretty much the same mm -hmm. as India versus the UK. Yeah. There's a lot of handing. We're having to move ha um, plastic a lot. It's not done by robots, it's done by people. So there you are, wages, yeah. premises. The decal sheet cost is the same because 90-odd uh, percent of our decals are from Cartograph in Italy. So that cost remains the same. Yeah. But someone's still going to put it in a box. Yeah, and that's, that's why still, I mean, it must be the wage bill. That's, that's it's still time. Yeah. And then you've got that box in, in total. Right. And then you've got, you've got your sort of general yeah. bits and pieces. So surprisingly, it, is, mm -hmm. it, it, it isn't much. Uh, there isn't much in it. Onto the Vintage Classics range now, and are there any plans to bring back the 112th figure kits from the old days? You will see Napoleon in the warehouse. That sounds weird. Uh, Napoleon is sat next to Queen Victoria in the warehouse. Even weirder. Um, so, um, Victoria or Elizabeth? One of the two. Um, she's out, she's out and they're, they're both sat next to each other on, on a pallet, which always makes me smile, because I think one of them is giving the... Uh, Napoleon's mostly just going, please someone move me. Um, um, yes, I'd like to bring those back at some point. We have the tools, the guardsmen, um, a number of the soldier figures, uh, 112 scale, I think they are, they have been in the range in the last 10 or so years. So those tools are already out in India uh, or wherever. Um, yes, it would be good to, to bring those back. How often is a kit likely to be released as a vintage classic? Um, with a vintage classic range, we are on a sort of 10 year cycle with those. Mm -hmm. um, so anything that comes into the range now is pretty much a one hit wonder. We, yeah, we will bring it in, we'll do one production run, second if it goes reasonably well, um, and then that's it, you know, that tool then gets put up on a shelf and the plan is never to touch that again for 10 years. Um, so that's why I say they're not limited additions because it still gives us the option to, to run them wherever we want to, um, but they are limited. You know, everything is limited, even Matt's Anson is going to be limited. Uh, we are only going to ever make X number and then that's it, you know. Yeah. And the choice of which kits that uh, become vintage classics is quite complex and I guess 
Are there any specific problems that arise during the choice of kit for re-release? Might be worth mentioning as well. So sometimes we'll come up with a big list of vintage classics that we want to come out with you the next year. Um, and we'll have the tools out there, um, but that's no guarantee that we'll be able to use them. Um, so you do have to do a sort of a test run on them and see if the plastics, you know, there's been a lot of wear and tear to those molds and see if you can actually get decent parts out of them and people can still build the model. So um, sometimes it might be on the list, but you just can't release it because either it's on the list and it's not there, as we've had happen, or um, yeah, the parts just aren't good enough. Mm. So that's then, always a bit disappointing. And then <laughs> because the, some of the molds are so old, they're not always complete. Oh. Um, so there's been a couple recently where we've discovered that the, um, so for the clear parts for some of the smaller aircraft. Um, you can, you the, can name it if you want. Well, there's been th uh, three, I think it was the, it was the Bulldog, um, the Henschel 123 and the Beagle Bassett. The clear, clear molds mm. have disappeared. So we've actually gone through a process um, of reverse engineering the, and retooling the, the clear parts, and say so for the for the Beagle Bassett, um, we had, we were able to laser scan um, the fuselage parts and then re-engineer the clear parts so they probably fit better than the the, the original ones do. Um, so you'll see that out, out. The label Vintage Classics is a marketing thing. It's a marketing tool. It's an identity within the range. What defines a kit as being within the Vintage Classics range as opposed to simply a reissue with new box art? You know, if you think back, Airfix was acquired by Hornby back in 2006. Mm. You know, um, I would say, what, uh, 10 years? You know, from the beginning we've been using what we now class as Vintage Classic tools mm. in shiny red boxes with yeah. digital illustrations. It was only in the last couple of years that the team said, Okay, you know, not that we were ever trying to hide the fact that they're old tools, but if you go back to the discussion, I, uh, uh, what I mentioned about starter sets, if you're a kid in a shop and you have no idea what's a new tool um, and what's not, you know, and the first kit you buy is a brand new tool, you have an amazing experience with it, the second kit you buy ends up being what we now call a vintage classic in the same shiny red box with a cool digital illustration, you're literally going to go, what is this? And have an awful experience. That was one of the reasons for going vintage classic, different box, different logo. Um, so pretty much anything pre-Hornby is now uh, vintage classic. Is it, that's what it is, that's the cut off point. It's not, so what is that, 20 years? So only two in its own 15 years you then put into a vintage classic? Yes, yeah. but there are some exceptions which, which we have yet <laughs> to have to try and answer. So uh, a number of kits that Hornby released, mm. they were never released under Humbrol Airfix, um, but they were designed Humbrol Airfix. Uh, they've never been in a vintage box because Hornby released it. Um, but the design and tooling perhaps isn't quite right um, for what we would want to put in a shiny red box with digital with illustration. So uh, Nimrod yeah. was never designed here. Yeah. Uh, the TSR2, that was designed here. If it falls on that it just falls on the, on the edge. Uh, the 148 scale cameras, you know, all four of them released in the same year. Yeah. Christ. Um, you know. <laughs> the other criteria for vintage classic is that it's got some box art that is worthy of putting out again as well. Yeah. And that kind of takes you back further than, yeah, than the 90s mm. and the early, early noughties really. So, yeah. you know, one of the things we realised about um, our back catalogue was not just that there were some models in it that were unique to us that you couldn't buy anywhere else and so we wanted to put them out again. But they also had brilliant period box artwork that everybody loved and older modelers remembered. Um, and, and so we could not exactly recreate the model as it was sold in the 60s or 70s, but, but you could create something that was evocative of that era. Um, and, and, that, and that separated it again yeah. even more from, from the modern range. Do you, do, you, do you remanufacture the tools out of vintage classics? Because I did a, a review of the old, is it the Fiat G50? It's the old to the new, and the old one's crap, 
and the new ones a lot more sharper, if you know what I mean, in the new box. Did you actually do anything to the tooling, like repair them? Um, it's unlikely that it would have had much work done on right. it. Because, um, yeah. yeah. Do you so change the formulation I mean, have, of the plastic? Get, well, that's a possibility, yeah. of course, that, that modern plastics are perhaps better than the 1960s plastic. Yeah. But the guys will run test shots through yeah. the old tooling, wherever that tooling is, well we ship yeah. it. If it's tooling here, obviously it goes to India for a production run, but before we put it in a box, the, the guys will get test runs from it. Not necessarily test shots, mm -hmm. um, but they are. Um, and if at that point it's a bit of a dog, then we mm -hmm. have to go, do we want to release this? Is, is there anything we can do to the tool to improve it? And if we're still not comfortable with it, we won't put it out on the market. Um, there are some that are just on that edge, um, but you know we're reasonably happy. And with the marketplace knowing that you're buying a vintage classic, it's not going to be Anson. <laughs> you know, if, you, if we re-release re the 172nd scale Anson, it is not going to be anything like the 148 scale. You know, that, that tooling is so old. Is the Vintage Classics marketing brand really aimed at the nostalgic builder rather than the new one? Do you think with the Vintage Classics you're selling more on nostalgia than the current range? The current range is more up there and, and maybe it's old geeks like us mm -hmm. who are more likely to build them because we remember making them. You yes. Know, if, if, yeah. you, if you do a, an old black plastic sterling, for example, you probably ship quite a few of them. We start making some stuff yeah, with black plastic. We remember, yeah. we remember doing things like that. Mm. Yeah. Negotiating for the extra sixpence because it was ten and six at Christmas and stuff oh, yeah. like that. Um, but you know, do you think that's where, where, where your marketing perhaps is more aimed? As, as the nostalgia, nostalgia, I remember making one of these. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but there's also gaps in the market that no one, none of our competitors have filled yeah. um, and we have the tooling for a vintage mm -hmm. classic. So I would say yes to that. Um, but you know, Beagle Bassett, has that been done in 70 seconds by anyone else? Mm -hmm. If you really want to make one, regardless of what label it's in, if it's vintage classic or not, you are going to buy it. But you're also going to be asking yourself, was there ever really much of a market for a, does, do, do many model makers know what Beagle Bassett even looks like that they want to buy one? Whereas maybe you, your buyers here in the UK might have more of an idea and they will think, well, it's an F ethics once made a model of it, it must be worth yeah. making. Um, but certainly not, not worth Italy or anyone else making a new tool of it. No, exactly, yeah. exactly. And don't forget, just because we've got vintage classic tooling sat there of a particular subject in a particular scale doesn't mean that we won't go and hit it again sure. as a new tool. Sure. Um, either because it just warrants it, there's a big gap in the market and ours is still the is still the best one even though it's 1970s tooling uh, we know we can do a better job so we will we will put it in the plan again definitely nowadays fx kits are bundled primarily with cartograph decals um, how did that come about and how is your relationship with cartograph Martin to thank for that. so uh, yeah it's not a simple thing to make yeah. and I mean, look at Martin because I was here when it happened as well. Matt, you must have been around. But you know, when Airfix, uh, we started to make Airfix again. Mm -hmm. There's Hornby. Obviously, all the tools or a lot of the tools that we needed were shipped out to China because that's what Hornby knew. You know, Hornby knew Chinese manufacturing for Scale Electric and for Hornby. Mm -hmm. um, so all the tools went out to China, and we said to the Chinese, right, build, make us some decals. If you cast your mind back to 2007, 2008, yeah. those decals were terrible. Yeah. And so what would you do? Phone us up, we'll send you another set of decals, sir. All right, these are really shit as well. So, um, so in the end, the call was, we just need to get the best, and that was Cartograph. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we don't, we've, we've never really looked back, but as Martin said, they, they know their stuff. You know, mm -hmm. they are business-minded people, and consequently, we do pay for it. So, um, you know, and I think it's, we've, we've certainly mentioned this in a sprue talk, but some of the times we pay, the, the, the cost of the plastic is the same as the decal sheet. Mm -hmm. And that's quite something. You know, you think it's just a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. No, 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 far, far from it. So, so if you think about it, you know, 
we set out 10 years ago to improve the quality of the plastic parts, mm. the design and, and, the, and the manufacture of it. If the, if the decals weren't the best out there, then there was no point in doing the plastic because yes, the, right, yeah. you know, the, the product as a whole was always going to be inferior, so yeah. it had to be done. Um, so the only decals that uh, don't come from Cartograph is our 35th scale range. For some of you will know um, So that's at the moment that's the only range in our you know uh, that don't Why use. Why is that? Uh, because we buy them essentially from Academy. Oh. So Academy, you know, there's no point in us shipping decals from Italy to South Korea for them okay. to put them in. So. Uh, their decals are okay. Uh, the decals we've seen for the Anson, oh, uh, ambulance, sorry, I always get those two mixed up, A's and A's, um, for the ambulance are very good. Um, so we, we are happy with them. There's no need to, to add huge additional costs to ship stuff from Italy over to, their, to them to pack it. And the last thing we ever want to do is have to open boxes in the UK and start putting new decal sheets in because we go back to um, the number of hands touching a kit and that just increases the cost tenfold. So, um, so, that, so that's, that's the only range at the moment. And talking of outside relationships, the 135th scale range is all made by Academy. How does that relationship work? I'll, I'll go back to the Academy relationship as well, yeah. just to be absolutely crystal on that, on why we have that relationship. Um, because it's no secret that they're academy, especially if you know. Um, for us to enter the 35th scale market, um, there is no way that we could have designed a range and hit the, you know, the market with a range of vehicles. There's no way. Um, you know, other um, model, uh, model companies have that sewn up. So for us to go in there, even in a small way, we had to partner with someone. No, we're not going to partner with T. <laughs> uh, we're not going to partner with Tamiya uh, and a number of others who have good, uh, good sales channels in the UK. So Academy seemed like a good fit there. We also use their in-house design capabilities as well. So the new tools that you see coming through uh, from us in 35th scale up to this point, uh, we've done the research, they do the design. But they are Airfix tools, and you will only see them in Airfix boxing at the moment. So, uh, so far, they have not phoned us up and said, we would like to put these in Academy, Academy boxes um, for our own market. All right, so the Cromwells and the Ambulance, um, so far, they are designed by them, researched by us, designed by them, Airfix boxing only. All right, and that's sort of where that, that range sort of splits in, in sort of, not half, but starts to start to split about a bit. Um, People have asked, why don't you design, go and design a 135th scale Tiger 1? Well, how many Tiger 1s are there in 135 scale and is it really worth it? Are we going to make enough to pay that tooling back in whatever period of time? No, unlikely. Um, so the best way of us is to have that relationship with Canada. And it seems to work really well. So. Yeah. Um, you know, and Airfix has a long history with buying bagged mm. kits and selling bagged kits onto others. Uh, although we don't actually really do that anymore. No. Um, we, we don't have a need. We're also, um, our focus on, is on our, uh, our own range, mm -hmm. not anyone else's. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's something that the whole industry does, mm. by and large. But... Um, uh, yeah, so that's. I just want to explain mm. the 35th scale range, really, because I know some questions quite often pop up on that. Another big question that everyone's asking is, why have so many launch dates slipped recently? Just talking about ensuring that schedules are, are, are maintained. Obviously, COVID and, and the whole world turned upside down with that. Uh, and Airfix was impacted, uh, and our schedules uh, you know, were, were challenged. Um, but I'm pleased to say, of all the brands in the business, um, Airfix was brought back on track much, much quicker than any of the others. Uh, and some of the others are still, are still um, fighting some battles, whereas the great team here were able to turn that around. And any delays out of India or wherever um, were very quickly overcome. And that's why this year, you know, when we've said you know, the, the Buccaneer will be released in August, it will be released in August. Um, albeit the container ship doesn't turn right instead of left, 
And trust me, that happens as well. So we were, a couple of weeks ago, we were tracking container ship up through the English Channel, which was meant to come straight into, into the UK. It didn't, it turned right and went into Rotterdam. And you're literally sat there watching it going, there is nothing you can do. Mm. But there is, you can't, there's no one you can phone up to have a win so that your, your container on this massive ship has gone into Rotterdam instead of the UK first because you are a very small part of that container ship. That's so probably the congestion of, say, Felix boat. Because yeah. so, if you follow this off like, the west coast of the USA, there's like, a big circle. Oh, ships yeah. off the Mexican coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah no one can see them, so no one's reporting on, on them, apart from these guys who are tracking them. And yeah. they're, they're just full and full and full because they can't get the stuff out of the ports. Yeah, and our stuff is sat in them. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so that's what, when I say pray, pray to the container gods, mm. it really is, yeah. The best job that we can do is, is get the product finalised, you know, box artwork, all the, all the plastic, everything, decal sheets, get that done as soon as we can or on our schedule, which the, the team do an amazing job in, in achieving, and get it into a container uh, and on a ship as soon as possible. And from that point, we are literally sat back for the ride, uh, albeit working on other projects. Did you, did you get um, a restart of business from India before you would have done in China? Because China was, a lot of industry was locked down once they started unlocking. Um, the, the transport market just was flooded. I mean, you're seeing like ten, ten, twelve thousand dollars a container at one point and, through the Suez Canal, and the rest. And, th and then, of course, yeah. and then they messed up the Suez Canal by parking a ship across it as well. So that stopped everything. Yeah. But was it that India was able to ship just that little bit quicker? So, like, you, you got in before the, the bulk of stuff coming in from the Far East, maybe? India didn't really lock down in the same way. Okay. Um, they did sort of lock down, but not in the total way that... So they were kind of like shutting factories for a couple of days a week right. instead of, you know, for long, long periods of time. So actually, their shutdowns lasted longer, but they were never complete. So, mm -hmm. so um, we were always able to, still get, to get something out. Yeah. Yeah. I think the worst one was not being able to ship the empty containers back to Yeah, 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 yeah. And that remains. You know, there's still yeah, farms yeah. around Felixstowe that are full of containers ready to go back to that side of the world. But, you know, that's, as I said, that all we can do is make sure that that product is um, signed off, ready to go, in a container in India or wherever, and um, booked onto a ship. From that point, we're in for the ride. So, just, just as a rough number, how many kits do you get in a container? A standard how container? big is the box? Yes, as, you're just, you're on average, because yeah, you're going to have some that are like massive boxes. But do you? Is it all like one one product per container, or do you mix no, and no, match? No, no, no. So, so they, they are mixed. Um, so they will be mixed containers yeah. of whatever series, whatever we've got in production. Say a thousand or something. Like that. So I think the big Spitfire. I think it was four thousand pieces. Yeah. I think you, I think we could get four thousand Spitfires in a forty foot right. container. So, <laughs> so, but not that we have to worry about that. Yeah, but yeah, I seem yeah. to remember that number from yeah. trying to work yeah. out the costings and everything. So, from small small kits could be into like 10, 10, 15 thousand. I'd right? love to be able to make that, but we won't serve them. Sure. <laughs> so don't don't That's you know? Don't, I just just so as, as an idea, you know, so you, you know, you talk about container costs and all that, and you think, well, how many kits are there? It's, you know, that's just a rough yeah, idea. Thousands, 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 yeah. thousands yeah. but you know, that's not tens um, of thousands, not hundred, but not hundreds either. No, 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 at all. But you've got to bear in mind that our kit price is a series one kit is what eight, nine quid, mm -hmm. something like that. So that. 16, 17,000 pound 40 foot container yeah. has got to be split down oh, to yeah. products that are reasonably cheap, or well, not mm -hmm. cheap, but you know, you, you, you know what I'm trying to say, it's, yeah. it's a, a low price point to begin with, so it could be 20p more, mm -hmm. but that 20p is a big difference on that um, eight pound price point, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that's, that's always, always the battle. The other battle, of course, is, is not putting our prices through the roof and then hoping that container prices come down and then moving prices around again. So we're, we, we are managing that on a sort of monthly basis really and praying that container prices start to come down. And they are, uh, which, is, which is good. So, mm. right. Last year Aldi was selling FX kits for £5 a go, six of them in the range. Are you planning to do the same thing with Aldi again this Christmas?
so, uh, so Audi is a winner. You know? I'll tell you now. So uh, the Audi business, um, uh, we're seeing new business from it this yeah. year again, and also Lidl. So uh, you'll see you'll see it in both locations this year. Yeah. So Excellent. changing the range is still going to be the same five. Uh, I can't remember what we've done actually. I, I, I certainly know that we went to try and change a couple around. Yeah. But you've got to bear in mind that why are we doing that? We make hardly any money on it, but um, the, the reason for it is middle aisle stuff. Is, yeah. Oh, the weather's going to be rubbish this weekend. I'll oh, buy little Johnny or, or Sarah or whatever, you know, something to do this weekend. And that's the whole point of that. So if you start talking about recruitment marketing, it's not just marketing stuff, yeah, um, but it's also about where your product is in the marketplace. Um, whilst you might still have independent model stores in your local town or so, you know, the 35 year old mum is never going to go in there. So uh, we'll never dream about going in there unless you know, she has a hobby that, that fulfills. But if they go into Aldi or Lidl to, for their weekly shop or whatever, buy a plastic model kit, and Antics actually told me the other week at Riyadh that the Aldi Lidl business is the best thing that could have ever happened to them because they're going into Aldi Lidl, they're buying one or two kits, they're mm. then going straight down to Antics saying, oh, this is brilliant, I want something a little bit different, or yeah. I need some paints. So it's driving business back to these independent retailers. And finally, what do you think was the most successful Airfix kit ever made? Spitfire? Mm. It's it's Spitfire. 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 But which one? Because there was like a number some of different toolings since yeah. like the 1950s. Yeah. It would be the Mark 9. It would be Johnny Johnson. It would be the Mark 9 that we were selling in the 60s, probably. It's just because the market was at its height at that time. So and it retired in 2005, that tool. Yeah. So it had a really long run. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So we, that is probably it. We sell more Spitfire starter sets than any other ski. So there we go. Some good questions from the guys, I thought, and some good and open answers as well, as much as commercial sensitivity will allow, of course. Now, if FX do this again, and I really hope they do, because I think it was a great day for everyone, for them as well as for us, then I'll give you advance notice and we will together, cobble together all the questions that we should put either during the day or as part of the Q&A session at the end. And let's get some answers. They seem ready to answer. Let's try them out with a few more things, okay? Now, if you've liked the video, I hope you really have, then please do thumbs up to like it in the symbol down there below and if you haven't please subscribe to the channel it helps me doesn't cost you anything thank you so much for watching and i will see you next time